This is Rough Science, coming to you from the Spice Island of Zanzibar off the east coast of Africa. Our scientists face their toughest trial yet as they take on the ocean. They have to complete a set of marine challenges with a few simple tools, some basic bits of kit and a boatload of ingenuity. Our base on the Indian Ocean is a traditional fishing dhow and our site on land is an isolated beachside workshop. It's destination paradise for rough science. Our four scientists are Kathy Sykes, a resourceful physicist with boundless yes! energy. Mike Bullivant, an imaginative chemist who embraces the near impossible. Oh, yes. oh my word! <laughs> Ellen McCauley, a fearless have -a -go botanist from Missouri. The next thing is rinse it. <laughs> Jonathan Hare, physicist, inspired inventor and artistic engineer. And me, Kate Humble, an experienced diver, I'll be going underwater to put their inventions to the ultimate test. Together we are Rough Science. I had a curious premonition last night that in three days' time I'm going to be on a boat that's going to get into trouble and I'm going to have to abandon that ship. So I'd like to be prepared for every eventuality. So, Mikey B, could you make me some sort of signalling device, a distress flare, if you like, to, um, <laughs> to pinpoint my position for any potential rescuers? <laughs> and then Cathy and Ellen, if you could come up with something that's actually going to keep me afloat in the water. Potentially for quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> if it's us rescuing you, yes. And then Jonathan, um, the other part of this premonition is that it might happen in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you think you could come up with some sort of beacon that okay. could be on the flotation device yeah. so that when those rescuers come scampering to my aid, <laughs> They can find me. Okay. So you have three days. Everything in the workshop <laughs> that you can use, anything you can find around here, and the magic trunk. And please don't fail. <laughs> this week the trunk is very bare. It's a sugar cane, isn't it? Yeah. And the challenges are going to be a real test of the scientists' ingenuity. They have no choice but to rely on the natural resources of the island. They've got until nightfall on day three when I'll be in the water, in the dark and in need of rescuing. The currents in the waters around Zanzibar are fast and strong, so as far as I'm concerned, failure is not an option. So I'm beginning to regret being a scientist human guinea pig. The sea is not looking much fun this morning. Mike's wasting no time. He's heard about a local cave system that's home to a colony of bats. It's a long shot, but he's hoping to extract one of the chemicals he needs for my flare from their droppings. It's a dirty and potentially dangerous job. Now then, Jonathan Hare. How are you going to come up with this hugely bright light? For well, I don't me? know about that. But the radio had lots of these little lights on. Okay. So yeah. I reckon I can use these because they're very low voltage little bulbs. But tiny, <laughs> they John. No one's going to see those. That's all I've got. <laughs> and I've got quite a few of them. And hopefully, if, maybe if I can flash them or something, pulse them, then they'll be brighter. And if it's pitch dark, <laughs> even in the roaring sea, you see that. Okay, so how are you going to power them? Well, you know a car battery has acid in it? Yeah. Well, basically, every battery needs a liquid and electrolyte. Right. But we can use seawater. It won't be as powerful, but I'll, I'll show you. Basically, if you take two different metals and you yeah. put them in seawater, mm. you get a voltage produced, and you actually see them. Can you see on the meter? Oh, yeah. God, that's brilliant. So as I hit the water, the seawater will kind of flood into the works and make everything work? Yeah, yeah. So is that enough voltage that could... Power light, basically. No, not really. That's the tricky bit. I've got to think of somewhere to do it. But... Think hard on that, indeed. And I want bigger bulbs, Jonathan. I'm just... I'm worried about those bulbs. Well, that's all I've got. If Jonathan can't increase the voltage from his battery, it's not going to power any lights, however tiny. So I'll have no beacon and a life jacket that looks like a couple of old pillows. And I'm hoping that this is stuffed with K-pop. Fiber, because that's typically what um, people stuff pillows and mattresses with. And I've seen a lot of K-pop trees on this island. And how does K-pop help us? Well, how does it work? Historically, it's been used for, for life preservers, so I figure oh. we're going to be making a life preserver. There we go. Yeah, this is the stuff. 
the fiber comes out of the seed pod. And this has a slightly waxy coating, so it's slightly water resistant, which is helpful. But also, it's pretty buoyant until it gets matted badly. And this is still pretty fluffy. OK, but we'll have to coat it with something, presumably. I mean, if we don't do it pillow into water, right. and you held it under with a weight like Kate's, mm -hmm. then it would just get logged in the sink, wouldn't it? And that's where this comes in. This is a rubber knife. I've seen a lot of rubber trees on the island, so I think we can tap some rubber. Ellen and Kathy plan to use rubber to make a waterproof coating for my life jacket, but first they have to design it. Mike's explorations have taken him nearly half a kilometre underground, but he's finally found what he's looking for. It's not just any bat droppings that will do, though. It's not the top surface of the bat droppings I want, it's the lower surface, because they'll have been there for longer. And with biological action, we'll have converted the bat droppings into the, one of the chemicals that we want for our flare. But it's so hot down here, you wouldn't believe it. Back at base, Jonathan is in better spirits than Mike. He thinks he's found a way to increase his battery power using an ice cube tray and a few zinc screws. I've got a metal screw and a carbon rod, and these are both conductors of electricity. And when I put these two conductors in the seawater, chemistry goes on. What happens is charged metal atoms come off into the salt water, called ions, and make the metal screw charged. The same thing happens, or similar thing happens with the carbon, but to a different extent. So one becomes positive, one becomes negative. And that difference in charge, plus and minus, is the voltage. And so we've made a little battery. Now what I've done is I've wired up six of these, one after the other, so that we can add the electricity from all of them. And you can see it goes right up to almost five volts, which will be about right, six times the single one. So we're able to get more energy by joining these up. So it looks like Jonathan has found a way to produce enough electricity to power my beacon. For the rest of the team, progress is taking a little bit longer. It's an afternoon of sewing, digging, and some more sewing. Oh, <laughs> God! Imagine how this is going to save my life. And then Mike finally returns from the back cave and starts demolishing the sugar cane from the trunk. Now, Bullivant. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God, what is that? This is going to be your flare. Talk me through this flare, then. What are you going to do? Well, the idea is I'm going to make a rocket-type flare. OK. You should be able to shoot up in the air. What, like a beautiful firework? Yeah, it's a firework. I need gunpowder. OK, and what does a rocket have to do with that... I, what is it? Well, this is bat droppings in here. Of course we collect it, is. it. We drop oh. the bat droppings in water. Right. And the bat droppings contains a chemical, potassium nitrate, which I need for the gunpowder. It's one of the two chemicals I need. OK. The potassium nitrate will dissolve in the water, uh, the hot water, so I filter off anything that doesn't dissolve, so I've got a solution of potassium nitrate. The other chemical I need for the gunpowder, yeah. for the rocket, is sugar. And you gave me some sugar cane in the trunk, didn't you? Oh, just... wow. so you're extracting the sugar from the cane? Yeah, it dissolves in water. So you'll end up with a kind of sugary water and potassium nitrate water. Yep. And and that's your gunpowder. Mix basically. those two together, dry them out, evaporate off, get a solid, that's your gunpowder. And then just when I thought things were looking up, Jonathan has come up against a tricky design challenge with his battery. The problem I've got, of course, in the ice cube tray, all the liquid is separated. Imagine now putting this in the sea. The problem is because the seawater is conducting, it shorts out all of them and we're back to a single cell. So the next big challenge that I've got to do is got to somehow let the water in to make the battery work and make sure they don't all short circuit. Not great news considering it's the end of day one and my life is in the hands of some tree fluff, a pot of bat droppings and the tiniest light I've ever seen.
It's 6am on day two and a very early start at the rubber plantation for Ellen and Cathy. OK. First thing we do is we remove the rubber from the last time the tree was tapped. It's still really elastic. Then... There's your tool. Yeah. And all we want to do is take off a very, very thin layer. You see how it starts coming already? Yeah, it flows <laughs> immediately. Okay. Then, before it starts flowing, you just set it up. Fantastic. Isn't that amazing? The reason we're here so early is because this is when the latex flows really fast. The trees will stop running about 10 o'clock really fast like this. We'll collect all the rubber and head back to base. Doesn't this damage the tree? Actually, not much, because all we're doing is cutting into the inner bark. and The latex is actually like a protection layer. So this is like an outer protective shell for the tree? Mm-hmm. Wow. Next. Let's do it. Your turn. Back at base, Jonathan has an idea which he hopes will solve his short circuit problem and keep my beacon alight. I want the water to go in, but I don't want it to be immersed in water because it will just short circuit the battery. So I'm using the sponge so that when it falls in the water, the sponge will take up most of the seawater. And then hopefully it can be on the thing that Kate's going to wear. And all the excess water will fall off, but the sponges will keep the seawater next to the electrodes. So it's just a mechanism by which I can get water in, keep it where it needs to be, and make sure it's not where it shouldn't be. At the rubber plantation, tapping is interrupted by unexpected visitors. Ow! Can you feel these ants? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, they bite. Look at that. Look how hard they hold on. See that? It's like... They're doing it for their life, isn't it? But you know what they do? They're protecting trees. <laughs> and that's their they job. Do a good job, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, so we're, we're disturbing... Turn we disturb the smaller trees. But in the Amazon, they use ants like this as sutures because once you can pull their body off, but once they've bitten in, they, they don't come off. Let's get out of here, Ellen. <laughs> you got to come back to get the rubber in an hour. By the end of a long morning's work, Ellen and Kathy have a bucket full of liquid rubber. Whether they can turn it into anything useful remains to be seen. It's lunchtime back at base, but Mike won't take a break. I want to get as much sugar out of this sugar cane, and I think I'm going to do that by cutting the sugar cane up into small, very small pieces. Mike won't know if he's been successful until he reduces down and then cools the liquid in the pot. At this stage, the sugar should crystallise out. Meanwhile, the bat droppings are taking even longer to deal with. He's got to boil up and painstakingly filter both bucketfuls to have any chance of extracting some potassium nitrate. This is... Latex. And... If we process it, it turns into rubber. So we're going to waterproof your life jacket using this, is the plan. Wow, so what do you need to do? Well, the first step is we need to add acid okay. so we can thicken the latex. Oh, OK. So if you just squeeze that into there. What? Lemon juice will start the, the sort of yeah, lemon gumming juice, up process, will Lemon it? juice is an acid. Right. And so just a moment ago, we poured about the same amount as we poured in here. Yeah. Added oh. lemon juice. <laughs> And we didn't move fast enough. And this oh is what we ended word. up with. Now, you'll see this isn't really strong enough. It's not elastic enough. It just breaks yeah. too easily. It's yeah. not like rubber. Right. So once we add the lemon juice, then we start to vulcanise it. What does vulcanise mean? Well, it's all about making it harder, making it tougher, making it more elastic. Right. So we add the fabric. Yeah. And then we'll spread it out over the heat and the smoke. Yeah. And it'll start to vulcanise. But to help, what we're going to do is add a bit of sulphur. Now, imagine that in here, there are lots and lots of rubber molecules, mm -hmm. and they're all kind of little strands like this, waving around. Now, when you vulcanise it, you cross them together and form little bridges between them, and you form a net. Yeah. And that net, you can kind of stretch, and then it will bounce back, because of the little sulphur bridges. OK. So this whole process is going to mean that you then have something absolutely workable, and hopefully, for my sake, waterproof. Strong, elastic, waterproof. For Ellen and Kathy, it's time to put the theory to the test. Okay. 
the moment of truth. You do it on one side. Oh, look, it's sticking. Yes, it's coagulating. Great. Give it a good squeeze. If the vulcanizing goes to plan, this section of the life jacket should end up with a flexible, waterproof coating of hard rubber. Down at the beach, Jonathan's having a nervous moment of his own. It's time to test his seawater battery in the sea. This is a really important test for me now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to plonk this in the water, fill it up with salt water, and then shake the thing, and hopefully uh, the salt water will only stay where it should do in the foam, and it should fall off everywhere else. And so consequently not short circuit the battery where it shouldn't be. So I'm hoping that when I put it in, the meter reading may show some reading. Then when I shake it, it should go shooting up. That's, the, uh, that's what it should do. I am a little bit nervous because if this doesn't work, I'm completely back to the drawing board on this one. So this has got to work. It's got to work. OK, here goes. OK, we've got a little reading now. Without a volt, which is what I expect. Now, if I shake it... Yeah, look at that! Brilliant! So it's not short second. I've got about eight, nine, almost ten volts. That's what I wanted. Oh, that's great news. So we've got almost nine and a half volts there, which will be more than enough to power our little lights. But it's not such good news for Ellen and Kathy. This is our life jacket. It just... It wasn't a good idea to sew it, was it? No, and then dip it. It's just all stuck together rather horribly, like a sad Christmas stocking. <laughs> it's not going to save cake. I don't think it would be impressed at all. So yesterday's entire day of sewing was a waste of time. Ellen and Kathy are going to have to start all over again. Oh, shoot. It's really is it quick? Their new plan is to rubberize the fabric first and then stitch it together to make the life jacket. For Mike, Ellen and Kathy, it's going to be a long and sweaty afternoon. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Stretches. You don't think it's going to happen. Even Mike is beginning to lose faith. I don't think the back droppings were old enough, because in the back cave they were only that deep. And we'd, even though we dug the bottom layer, you know, they, they were fresh bat droppings, I think. Um, and the older the bat droppings, the more potassium nitrate you're going to get. And I won't be able to test it until later on this afternoon when I reduce this right down. It's just so much harder than I thought it would be. With 24 hours to go and no flare and no life jacket in sight, I'm relieved that Jonathan, at least, is feeling more optimistic. OK, so she's weighing the life jacket round her. The battery's going to be right next to her, and then there's going to be a pole with the lights above her. So I made a little holder for the lights, and they go to a little switch. I've just got a little spring here. And so when Kate moves around in the water, that switch makes contact momentarily, so it's going to flash the lights on and off. Wide it up to one of the seawater batteries over here, and you can just about see the lights flashing. I think that's going to work. So Jonathan is nearly finished. And even Ellen and Kathy have something to show for their day's work. The question is, has Mike managed to extract the two chemicals he needs for my flare? Right then, Mikey B. Yeah. All I've seen you do today is be crouched over this fire. <laughs> have we got any results yet? I think we have. This is the sugar solution, yeah. which I've cooled in ice water. Yeah. And I hope the sugar should crystallise out of the water. Can oh, you see that solid the at the bottom? bottom? There? Yeah. That should be sugar. These that is, is one of the components that you need gunpowder. for gunpowder. Yeah, that was the easy part. This is the difficult one. This yeah. is the essence of bat droppings. Yeah. But I've soaked this paper in the solution, yeah. dried it out. Now, if there's potassium nitrate in the bat droppings, yeah. then this should burn like a fuse slowly. It should produce a bit of smoke, and it should burn with a lilac flame. OK, go on, go on, go on. Fingers huh? crossed. Yeah, all right, all right. Crossed. I've got them all crossed. And toes. It's not burning, Mike. <gasps> oh, oh, oh no. wow, we've got it. We have oh, it. fantastic! We have it. Oh, it's that almost like a firework on its own. I could cry. <laughs> Brilliant! <laughs> We've expected. We've got both the chemicals for the gunpowder.
It's the beginning of day three, and there's less than 12 hours to go until I meet my fate. Look at this! It's just amazing. Wow, and it's oh, even elastic. It's like Macintosh. It really mm. is like Macintosh. Hey, and yesterday it was so tacky yeah. that you could barely work with it. It just kept sticking to itself. And although it's still a bit tacky, it's so much more workable, which means it's pretty well cured. The vulcanizing's worked. Well, I think we're ready to test it for waterproofing. OK. So I'm going to pour some water on top of it. Right. And if it's waterproof, it should go rushing off. And if it's not, it will absorb into the fabric. OK, let's see. Ready? Yep. Yeah, look at that! I have to say, you know, they are like Macintosh, but it's not much like a life jacket yet. We've yeah. got a lot to do today, Kate. Yeah. Mike also has a long way to go on my flare. As well as the casing, he has to work out how to launch it. But Jonathan has offered to help out. Well, I'm trying to think of a way that we can safely detonate these um, flares that Mike's going to make. We've got some nice little lighters here. So I'm thinking maybe we can have a string going back that Kate could pull, which will detonate the lighter, which will then fire the flare. Meanwhile, Mike is keen to show me his finished gunpowder. It may look like muesli, but he assures me it's a dried out mixture of the sugar and nitrate solutions. What's the chemistry? Oh, wow! Oh, my word! <laughs> That's not muesli. That is definitely not the music. That was amazing. So what is it about those two ingredients, the sugar and the bat poo, that make that happen? Well, the sugar is the fuel. Right. And the potassium nitrate provides a source of oxygen to allow the fuel to burn. That but you see, all of the solid is gone. It's just just converted totally, to gas. totally gone. OK, so... It clearly, I don't need any more proof. It burns beautifully, but how does it make a rocket go... Well, this is a rocket casing. Yeah. We'll just pack this rocket casing with the gunpowder. OK. And then seal it very tightly at this end, mm -hmm. so that when we burn the gunpowder and it produces all those hot gases, yeah. it comes out through this exhaust. See that tiny hole? Right. That's called the motor. Yeah. And as the hot gases are forced to come out through here... Yeah. Newton's law says that there's a reaction to that and mm -hmm. the rocket flies in that direction. So that is what provides the lift or the thrust, basically, is, exactly. the, is the exhaust fumes coming out. So, um, are you feeling confident? I am feeling confident. <laughs> <laughs> We've still got plenty of time to play around as well. Cathy and Ellen are also feeling pleased with themselves. They've managed to find a way out of doing any more stitching. Instead, they're soldering my life jacket together. Anything to avoid sewing. <laughs> Anything to avoid sewing. When it comes to the stuffing, Cathy has decided it's going to take more than Kapok to support my weight. I think this is Kate's life at stake, Alan. We have to do everything you possibly can. For Mike and Jonathan, the countdown to their test launch begins. They need to know if Jonathan's lighter detonator can ignite the flare from a distance. Go, OK, man. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. No lift off yet. OK, I'm just going to make sure that's in the flame properly. OK, that looks good. OK. Is it going to go? Oh. Nope, and things aren't going to plan for Ellen and Kathy either. Their efforts to avoid sewing have got them into trouble. We are melting solid glue to try to make a seal, and it's all because once the K-POC gets onto the, um, the rubberized material, it stops it from sticking to itself. So this is our last resort. Jonathan and Mike still can't get the lighter mechanism to work. Well, there's fuel in there, Jake. Maybe we have to go for the electric ignition. So it's plan B, electrical detonation. So basically what you do is you, you have a very thin electrical wire which goes into the rocket and you wire that up with really thick cables to the car battery and that glows red hot and will light the gunpowder. But as ever, time is the big factor. I think we've got about an hour to go. Don't say that. <laughs> and we still have to stick the last bits of seal make the ropes and go over a few bits and pieces that didn't stick the first time around. It'll be all right. Right? Yeah.
Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> no, we've lost. Oh, look at it's that. Still it's still burning. It's still burning. Shall I swim out and get it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's any stick we've got. In the nick of time, Ellen and Kathy finish my life jacket just after sundown. But whilst the scientists' work may be done, my duties are just beginning. Wow. <laughs> I'm sounding a little nervous, but this looks good. Most Do you think it's going to float? The most beautiful life jacket on the planet. It is and very you can beautiful. Float anywhere you'd like. And just what do I do with that? that? Really tight round here to keep it on you. Okay, so. okay, fine. Brilliant. Mikey B. I may do a flare. <gasps> Fab. Have okay. you got anything for me? Yeah, and when you fall in the water, this goes into the seawater. Yeah. And then you lift it up out of the seawater yeah. and the lights will flash. Okay. I feel rather like Queen Victoria, <laughs> actually. Okay, here's the plan. When it gets really dark, I will set off Mike Bullivant's flare. Mm. Please have your eyes open for it. It's me and I will need rescuing. Will do. We okay. will. Okay. We Good luck. Please, have please fun. say I'll see you soon. See, see you soon. soon. I don't see anything. Well, it's a beautiful night. It'd be even more beautiful if this flare works. Oh, Woo! Oh, there it is! Over yeah. oh, there, wow. Okay. Let's go. Okay. Let's go. Let's go. Okay, hold it in one. <laughs> I'm now going to plunge this in. Oh, oh, look, my LEDs are working. They're flashing. I have the current that's to take too far. Life jacket's working a treat. I think Ellen and Kathy have earned full marks for that. Can anybody really tell how far out she was? Three, four hundred metres. Three, four hundred, maybe even five hundred. It's quite a long way. Where are they? <laughs> Let's get to the front. Okay. Oh, I think I can see them. I hope they can see me. Oh, it is. Where? It is. Yeah. Look, it it's moving really fast. Oh, oh, she's to the left. They're red. Yeah. They're red. Yeah, they're moving quickly. Yeah, yeah. they're okay. moving really quickly. It's a strong yeah. current. Faster, though. Come and get me! Faster! Faster! Can you see my light? Yes! yes. For a rescue crew, <laughs> you make <laughs> your victims swim quite a long way. <laughs> I'm coming now. <laughs> oh. All right, here we are, trying to trip on you all. Well, I have to say, it is very totally declare that the flare went off. The life jacket did indeed save my life. <laughs> and the little LEDs, I mean, they lit for me. Were you the ones looking for them? Could you see them? Yeah, we could. <laughs> Thank you all very much indeed. Wow. And congratulations. Yeah. And that's all for this week's Rough Science, but join us next time for more. Well, <laughs> Next week, Ellen makes a mosquito repellent, and we have a look and a listen to Zanzibar's underwater world. For a free magazine about all Open University programmes, call 0870 900 9581 or go to open2.net where you'll also find more about this week's challenges.